Welcome to the Robot Podcast. I'm Fran Scott, maker, demonstration developer, and a massive engineering fan. Every week, my guests and I will be exploring the exciting stories of how robots can, will, and are impacting our everyday life. From sorting food to cleaning our hospitals, from manufacturing cars to creating sustainable buildings, robots are pushing the boundaries to meet the demands and challenges of a changing world. And as technology improves, it is becoming easier for robots to adapt and perform multiple tasks that, behind the scenes, offer huge societal benefits. It's all about flexibility and simplicity. It's now the final episode of this series of the Robot Podcast. And we started the series looking at ways robots chipped in to 2020. And we're ending it by looking at how they can protect our future. The future itself is an exciting topic, but I also find it a terrifying one because we know the catastrophic impacts of climate change could make the world a very different place to the one we all know now. And we desperately need to slow down and reverse this rise in carbon dioxide emissions. It's a problem we're battling from all angles. So, of course, robots can help. Joining me are Andrea Cassoni, Managing Director of General Industry Robotics at ABB. Hello, Fran. And Professor Robert Richardson from the University of Leeds, who once explored the pyramids of Giza with a robot. Hello. Now, before we go into any other questions, talk to me about the pyramids of Giza and the robot. So in the pyramids, the Great Pyramids in Egypt, there are lots of hidden spaces. So what we were doing is we're using robots to go inside the pyramid and explore spaces that hadn't been seen by people for thousands of years and trying to map and trying to understand what these were for. So we deployed robots inside shafts and they climbed inside these shafts from the centre of the pyramid towards the outer casing. And very excitingly, we found some writing that had not been seen since it's first been built the pyramid. So a really fantastic discovery. Really exciting. Oh, gosh. And and talking about using robotics to to solve problems and find the answers. Obviously, we are looking at robots and how they can help us be more sustainable. So let's start with the problem that we have. Andrea, can you just sort of set the scene for how big this problem is? The problem is enormous. We are simply using the resource of this planet to a level that is not sustainable anymore. But on the other side, we are seven or eight billion and growing, and we have needs and a system which is somehow working. So now we need to couple the two things, the economic growth and managing the resources in a way which we can sustain. So, Andrea, how can we use robots to try and fight climate change? Oh, it can be done in a number of ways, Fran. But maybe let's maybe clarify. Robots is a, a big category of machines. And we can split the essentially into the industrial robots, robots that typically are used in the, in the factory, and all the other robots, sometimes they are called service robots, which goes from drone to the domestic robot, for example, in, in, in house cleaning. If I take for a moment the first category, the industrial robot, they can help our future become more sustainable in a number of ways. Essentially, to me, they really help reducing waste of resources. What a robot in a factory does is to limit the amount of, of resources needed to the essential minimal. It's both for direct material as well as for energy consumption. It relates to the factory layout, to the factory footprint, which implies a reduction of energy consumptions, to a better quality, reducing scrap. Every time there is a scrap or, or uh, the need for a redo uh, an object in a factory, this means a waste of resources. So robots helps eliminate or reduce all this. Yeah, because it's waste not only at the point of creating the product, but like you said, you can then make the factory footprint much smaller, which saves the resources on building the factory. And it just keeps on escalating. And the more so the more efficient you can make every single process within every industry will just save waste from every angle we can possibly do. And that's what we're trying to achieve to increase sustainability. Yeah, exactly. You're right. And it changes the sustainability of the entire chain from manufacturing the raw material to shipping it uh, to the end users. 
Robots help stabilizing and improving manufacturing processes. Okay, so they reduce tremendously waste. Let me give you an example, Fran. Imagine a, a robot uh, painting, okay, painting an object. It could be a car. So the robot sprays, and by the fact that the robot is doing it and not a, a, a manual operator or a more rigid machine, you already save at least 30% of paint. So you need less paint to be produced, it goes on the car, uh, you already are avoiding to waste resources, right? But that's not the only thing. You, know, you reduce the footprint for the uh, spray booth, let's say, the environment where, where the car is painted. This requires less energy, less uh, need for ventilators to, to, to clean the air. Again, resources saved. You reduce the risk of making mistakes. Right? So you don't need to redo maybe this paint job again in the factory, or you reduce the risk of having your car rusting, for example, right? and need for repair out of the factory, of the car factory. So again, resources that are not used. Brilliant. Yes, there's so many different ways that robotics and robots can help in terms of industry. But what about with the service robots? And that's your area, isn't it, Robert? That's right, yes. In fact, we can build upon what's been discussed already. Um, a lot of the principles are very similar. So if we take the idea of um, reducing waste, we can take this forward into the wider city. When we repair and maintain these structures, we end up with um, lots of waste. So we can look at how we can do the right kind of engineering intervention to stop there being waste in the city. So just for example, um, if we wanted to pick up litter, we could do it in a smart way. So rather than a truck with, with a person inside walking around. If we could have a drone, for example, flying along and picking up these things very precisely, we would save energy in that way. Hang on. So are you saying we'll sort of end up with a future a bit like the film Wally, of where you have robots sort of picking up your, your litter as they go along? Well, we hope, of course, it's always good to change people's behaviour. So we're trying to avoid living in the first place. But absolutely, there will be robotic devices that will be charged with maintaining the place we live at. Part of that will be litter collection. Other parts, of course, will be other kinds of things that make our lives better. So robots themselves can help us be more sustainable in manufacturing. But what about the robots themselves? Because obviously they don't last forever. What happens at the end of a robot's life? And that's to you, Andrea. Robots last for several years, you, you know, between, I would say, 12 to 20. Actually, we have robots out there which are even older. But by reconditioning them, refurbish them, we can extend this life a lot. And that's a service, for example, that we offer as ABB. We, we get the robot back, we recondition the mechanical part, we change the controller, which is the brain of the robot. We up update it with the latest software and we are ready to extend the life of the robot itself. So make it the, more into a, a circular type of economy. So recycling robots doesn't seem that much of a challenge, but how do we go about actually making the life of a robot last that little bit longer? Well, this is somehow embedded in the concept of robotics flexibility, the possibility to reuse robot in a different job than the original one, extend his life and extend his usage in different type of applications or production compared to maybe the first one. This is another implication in terms of sustainability. With current need in manufacturing, like mass customization, and the need for constant changes in products, with robots, you don't need to change your production line every time you have a new product or a new packaging. You just need to reprogram the robot, eventually redeploy them, and here we go. So this also support the avoidance of waste of material, in this case, a production line. And Robert, what, what do you think about all this? What's, the, what's the, the best way that we can make robots more sustainable? Yeah, it's true. I, mean, I think one of the things we have to be careful of is, that, of course, robots have huge amounts of benefits. But like you say, we need to make sure that what we do doesn't create other kinds of problems. So robots must be able to be adaptable. They must be able to be reconfigured and also recyclable in terms of taking the parts, things apart and reusing them. I think this will become more and more of a concern in, or more and more of a issue we have to be aware of when we have more robots. So, of course, right now we have robots and they're rapidly increasing in the usage. Um, but most robots aren't in people's houses, aren't in the city, aren't everywhere. They're in very defined places. 
Of course, the future we hope for has more robots doing jobs we don't want to do. That's amazing. But we just have to be careful about that, 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 that these um, robots aren't going to cause other kinds of problems. So examples of sort of things could happen. Um, we think of drones as being so useful. Having packages delivered to our door would be amazing. You know, it's already wonderful to have perhaps seven or eight hours delivery. Imagine sort of 20 minutes would be fantastic. But we have to make sure we think about things like wildlife um, in terms of um, what, what the impact might be of drones interfering with birds, with bees, uh, and the component parts as well. How do we make the parts that can be either recycled or be reused? There are good examples of robots that can be somehow made of materials that can actually decompose. So, of course, lots of them have lots of plastic in, um, but could they be decomposed in some way? Um, we have the fundamental, of course, electronics. So very importantly, we do take the materials out of them, the rare earth materials, and make sure we reuse them in some way. So I think it's it's not um, a showstopper. We definitely can address this, but we must must be serious and make sure that we do understand, I guess, the challenges and this future of robots that can help us in every way um, doesn't become a hindrance. Making sure the roads aren't littered with robots that have fallen apart is very important. Now let's focus on manufacturing. Alban Malay joins us now and is CEO of x -E, a company that does large scale 3D printing. So Alban, can you tell us a little bit more about your work, please? So thank you for the invitation. Uh, so our work is really dedicated about having 3D printing at large scale for construction. So our aim when we created the company was really to have this new technology and to propose it to construction and precaster so they will be able to print complex shapes at a lower cost. So if you were to make these complicated shapes without 3D printing, how would you go about that? And would that lead to more waste? Yeah, it will lead to more waste and also it will lead to more cost to have less waste when you want to have like complex shapes you don't want to spend like 80% uh, of the material which is going to be a waste because you you have not the, the right solution to create this object or this wall or this furniture and you want to concentrate about putting in exactly the right quantity of material and that's what we are doing with our robots is to depose make a deposition of just the right amount of material like paste of concrete and we are not going to like in the traditional way having uh, some casting molds where you put you, you have to spend some time and some money and some material to do the casting mold and after you cast inside the, the concrete and when you just put exactly the concrete you have your final object without casting mold and uh, without any supplement of material which is not needed as for the final object. So you say it, it produces less waste in, in many ways. You know, you don't have to make the mould, you're using the right amount of material. Can you give us some facts and figures about what would be saved if we're doing these with the 3D printing rather than traditional methods? One of the first calculation we have made, we can go up to 60 70% of less material. So it will really depend on the application. And for example, we have a, a good example right now we are doing, it's a bridge we are doing for the Olympic Games in Paris. And we are optimizing the internal shape of the, the, the bridge. So we don't, we, so we have like a microstructure inside the bridge. It's like a bone. Like bones, yeah, it's, it's, it's empty, a bone. But before, they didn't have the solution to do this. They have to cast all the concrete inside. And with our solution, we can have microstructure inside the, the bridge. So we are sure that it's really strong shape with less material. That's really where we want to go. Like we don't want to, to do just cheaper and faster, but we want to do better and like with more functionality and lower waste. You need precision, and that's where just robotics can do. Like, people cannot be as precise as robots and as efficient. So how does the whole thing work? Talk me through step by step how you would go about creating a massive structure 3D printed. If you explain it step by step, so first you have a design. You work with architects and with civil engineers, and we use the robots 
like a, a robotic arm, but we just give him a program. So we are really precise of where we are going to put the material. And so the concrete is flowing from our, our mixing system, which is making a, a liquid concrete. And this liquid concrete is pumped up to the head and to the nozzle, which is handled by the robot. And like a big pen, the concrete is transformed where we put some admixture, which is starting to control the setting of the concrete. So we can manage to make it set in less than a minute and we control exactly the good property of the concrete. And after it's like a big drawing, like with a big robot, instead of having a pen and a paper, you have directly from the paint and the paper to the robotic arm and the concrete. And you start to draw what you want to print. So it's a bit like a pen and paper or like icing a cake, maybe. And then you can build up layer on layer on layer. And then you end up with your concrete object. Exactly. So Alban, could you give me some specific examples of some things that you've made? In fact, we have a big variety of products because we are not focusing on just housing or just furniture. For example, we have done some uh, ecological reefs. And so we have worked with some ecological uh, engineering firms, which were looking at artificial reefs, but not as before, where you had a lot of problems because the shapes were not adapt to the fishes. And now we really design up to microstructure where you have big pockets for, for example, uh, po- um, octopus, etc. And you're also s- smaller pockets for other type of fishes. So we try to adapt a good living environment to copy what we're doing like for traditional corals, but which have been destroyed because of the pollution, etc. And we try to reconstruct this kind of corals to make them have the perfect habitats. So in fact, we do better habitats for fishes and for humans now, but that's the next step for humans. But it's more simple for fishes than for humans. <laughs> I have absolutely loved chatting to you, Alban. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. That does sound like such a fascinating project, just generally and right up my street. Andrea, what what are your thoughts about all of that? I think it's fantastic. Uh, And I think in general, what's happening in the construction industry is fascinating. Now, we've heard about 3D printing, and you can imagine the effect that this has in terms of sustainability. It's intuitive. But that's not the only thing that, that, that's happening in, in the construction world. There are more and more real estate companies that are building part of the houses of, our, of our, the building into a real factories. And this enables a better use of resources, higher quality, the ability to continue to work regardless of the weather, And when the part is finished, imagine, for example, the skeleton of a room or of an entire room, then it gets shipped and mounted into the building on site with an enormous saving of resources and time. So in other words, it helps sustainability. Brilliant. And that's it from from an industrial point of view. But again, Robert... Your specialism is when it comes to these service robots and you have your own project that you are working on and developing. Can you tell us a bit more about that, please? Yeah, so I mean, essentially we can expand upon this idea of robots for construction to more broadly. So of course we we make things, that's great. And of course that's really good for robots. But when we have a city, for example, that's being constructed, of course it needs to be maintained throughout its life cycle. So we're working on the project called um, Self-Repairing Cities. And the idea is the city can automatically self-repair, self-maintain throughout its lifestyle. And of course, the longer you make assets last, the better it is for carbon and so forth. So it's really important that we keep this city working and going as it should do. Hang on, because self-repairing cities sounds something so sci-fi. Can you please give us more detail? Yeah, so what we want to do is we want to have the city that can automatically detect problems and then 
automate an intervention such that this failure goes away. So for example, um, we can have roads that have potholes in, which of course are very bad for the environment. What we can do is we can try and detect these before they become potholes. There's a whole pothole life cycle, um, interestingly enough, that starts from a small crack and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you don't catch it soon enough, you've got to do a massive engineering intervention changing the road. But what you can do is you can use robots to repair these cracks. So you can do, if you like, 3D printing of material into very small cracks. So a few grams of material would save tons of material being changed. So it's a very nice engineering balance. And not only does it save the material, but it also saves disruption. So absolutely, yes. At the moment, we have roadworks, which are often unbelievably disruptive. And of course, that, that, that affects in terms of people going about their business, about their own mental well-being, but also pollution. Of course, you've got the cars sitting there. And this is one of the biggest pollutions, actually, in cities, just cars just sitting there. If you can use robots to repair the cities, of course, you also remove construction vehicles, repair vehicles from the city. Um, this vehicle itself causes pollution, of course, as well as disrupting when it, it closes the road off. So by having this removed, you have a, a much smaller compact system that can repair and maintain things. I'll give the example of roads. This, of course, applies to all things. Changing a light bulb in a street light, for example, cutting down bushes that are in the way. All kinds of different interventions you can do with robots that help to prolong and maintain the city. And talk me through how it would actually work. You know, how do they actually survey what they need to survey? How do they find the problems? How do they fix them? How do they know what to fix? How do they know how to do it? Say all the above. How, how, how would they go about doing their jobs? So they're very much linked to the city of the future. So we already have lots of smart city things. The smart city right now is very much passive. Of course, we have sensors for water flow rates and we have sensors for all kinds of things. These robots will be linked to this, if you like, wealth of data. Of course, also linked to this will be autonomous cars. So we'll have all these different sensor things coming in and that'll give us a picture of the problems we might find. For example, autonomous cars already can detect potholes in roads, so they already can scan down and see them. So this data will be come together, fused together, and that'll create a knowledge base. And of course, the robots will use that to go and plan their missions. They then need to, of course, get to physical locations. They'll need to, at certain times of the day when no one's around, travel there, be it by air, be it by ground, or maybe even by water if they're inside pipes, get to the location, and then implement some kind of fix, which will be probably either adding material or somehow engineering a structure to make it better, stronger and make it last longer. How do you stop people from going, oh, do you know what? I'll have myself one of those robots, um, a little display on my um, mantelpiece. Um, the good thing about these kind of robots I'm talking about right now is they would scamper away. So you probably wouldn't be able to capture them. There is another class of robots which are perhaps doing litter collection that might be amongst us, that might be in a city slowly meandering around and you might see it. In that case, of course, there are these issues around people want to interact with them. There are good experiments where people kind of put robots in places and see what people do with them. And people like to interact with them, be it good or be it bad. They like to interact with them. So that's definitely a challenge. But I think as these things become more and more commonplace, it just wouldn't be interesting. You just wouldn't, it wouldn't, right now it's a novelty. It'd be great to go interact with a robot. But once you get used to these things, like a lamppost, you know, very, very few people want to interact with a lamppost. Um, there's just no reason to. So I think you would get used to it, that kind of thing. They'd be there all over the place and just part of our lives. Andrea, what, what do you think about this idea of this self-repairing city of the future? It's great, but we will have uh, so many robot or automated type of things in, in, into the city, right? Starting with vehicles. So yes, I think we will all get more used to see some kind of automation around us outside of the factories and in, in the cities, in the re in restaurants, that's also already happening in retail. Uh, so it will be part of our life more than, than today, I guess. So, so this type of automation is already happening behind the scenes. And what you're talking about, Rob, is actually having it out literally in the streets. Um, it does sound rather far-fetched and exciting. What sort of time scale are we talking about to actually make this type of self-repairing city a reality? So we have a target of 2050 for major cities to have this automation. I think 2050 is kind of a, a, a good safe target, I think, to go for. And say that everything is implemented that we've talked about here, what sort of 
implications would that have um, for the planet and for saving emissions and reducing emissions? So it have an absolutely enormous benefit. I mean, it's really for the infrastructure. It's about maintaining the length of it, how the longer it operates. So when you build things, a lot of the emissions are in the initial construction phase. That's where a lot of the, um, the environmental issues is. Of course, we can do things which are wonderful things about reducing that when we're building it. But if we can reduce the amount we create things, that's by far the biggest thing. And of course, the way we reduce the amount we create things is to make them last longer, to maintain them, to reuse them, to keep them going. Um, and that's what we hope to do with this project. So we've looked at how we can use robots to make us humans and the world we live in more sustainable. Andrea, what are the biggest barriers you think to robots actually making a real impact to reversing our rising emissions? Robots are, help sustainability, right? We've seen so many examples. So the more they can be used, the more the sustainability will accelerate all across the value chain, just as you noted, uh, uh, Fran. So an important part is your robots should be easy to be used so that they become actually good, not only for experts, but for every type of application, industry, or service usage. So the biggest barrier, the, one of the main paths will be to make them easy to be used. So user-friendly, simple, uh, as simple to be used as, as mobile phone today is. And that's, I think, the goal of the entire industry going forward. I think we're all of the camp that we want these robots to be taken up and used. But we know that sustainability isn't always the top priorities when it comes to running a company. So how do we actually make these robots be taken up by companies? This is one of those cases in which uh, economical advantage and sustainability goes together. Uh, while, while you save resources, typically you save also money. And so when a process becomes more efficient and you don't have quality issues, you support the environment, but you also support your bottom line. So as long as we can support the deployment of this type of investments, I think we will see this becoming more and more uh, used by all types of industry and not only for sustainability reasons. So let's say that money and technology were absolutely no object. What do you hope the possibility with robots is for the future? And I'll go to you, Rob, to begin with. So I think that, of course, robotics and automation is all really about freeing us from jobs that are mundane, that aren't challenging, that aren't useful, that are dangerous, that are, of course, dangerous to us, dangerous to the planet, dangerous to the environment. So we want to look to get robots in all of these tasks so we can pursue more creative, more things that humans can do well. So let's get robots doing the things that we don't need to do that are not really best suited for us. And then we can pursue more, more useful, more creative, more environmentally friendly, inspiring things that make us better as a people. Robert, it's lovely to hear your optimistic view of the future. Um, Andrea, do you share that view? Is, it, is the future bright? Yes, I, I share the view 100%. I think the future is bright. I imagine a future in which we use a fraction of resources to achieve more or less the same output. And on that note, that brings us to the end of this episode and the end of the series. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. If you haven't already, please do drop us a review on Apple Podcasts and hopefully we will be back for another series. Thanks to Andrea Cassoni from ABB and Professor Robert Richardson from the University of Leeds and of course, Alban Mallet from x e I'm Fran Scott, and the Robot Podcast is a fresh air production for ABB. Part of the ABB Decoded series. 